Welcome back for another video where I make you question everything you thought you knew about SIBO. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the beloved rifaximin and why you might not feel better on that drug for the reasons you think you are. So let me paint a scenario for you first, and then we're going to go into the nerdy, nerdy research. Imagine if you will, you or your doctor or testing something suggests to you that you might have SIBO and that might be the cause of your symptoms. So you take rifaximin and you feel great, stupendous, over the moon, back to normal. It's a gosh darn miracle. And in your mind or in your doctor's mind, that proves to you that you really have SIBO and it's the SIBO, it's the overgrowth, it's the bad boogeyman that is causing your symptoms. And then you get sucked down into the SIBO rabbit hole. You start doing antimicrobials, more antibiotics, you start prokinetics, you start doing elemental diets and restricted dieting and so on and so forth. And then I'll tell you, I hear the story a lot from the people who wind up working with me because they're feeling quite stuck and the SIBO bottle just isn't serving them at that point, or they've been told that they have a really tough case and that there's not much hope for them. But I'm here to tell you that the logical fallacy here is that we're making the assumption that you feel better on rifaximin because of its antibiotic qualities. And it must be that killing the SIBO is what made you feel better. And that's what gets people started on this goose chase of trying to kill and eradicate the SIBO. But I'm here to tell you, it's not that simple. It's not that linear. There are many different reasons why somebody might feel better on this drug. And they don't all have to do with direct antimicrobial efficacy. Yes, it's an antibiotic. Yes, it can kill Klebsiella and E. coli, and it can restore the microbiome in the small intestine. I'm familiar with all of that. You know, Pimentel's research, the Reimagine study, this has been shown repeatedly. And it does, for the most part, spare the colon microbiome, which is really rad. But I'm here to tell you about how this drug is anti-inflammatory. It modulates or balances the immune system. It heals leaky gut. And it's an, a gut environment modulator. So there are many reasons why you could feel good on this drug, and only one of them has to do with the microbiome and the SIBO. Let me put myself in head bubble mode and I'm gonna tell you more about that. Let's get into the nerdy research, guys. Okay, so rifaximin beyond the traditional antibiotic activity is our first article. And I went ahead and scrolled down to the part I needed here on this tab. They said, Rifaximin is an intestine-specific human pregnane X receptor agonist, PXR agonist. And they said the way this works isn't fully understood, but they think that it has a lot to do with the attenuation or the decrease in NF-kappa B expression, and that that leads to less abundance of inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 beta. This is huge. NF-kappa beta is the big dog when it comes to inflammation. That is the thing that kicks off a ton of inflammation in the body. And if we can shut that off and shut down these inflammatory cytokines, you're going to feel like a million bucks, ir irrespective of its effect on the microbiome. So here we have a pretty profoundly anti-inflammatory avenue for this drug to work. They went on to say that in uh, PXR humanized mice, Rifaximin prevented IBD after an inflammatory insult. So what they'll do typically in mice is that they will administer something like dextrin sodium sulfate or some sort of chemical to give the mice colitis and then they can experiment with them and treat them and, and try things. So in that model, they, they administered the damaging thing that would normally give them Crohn's or colitis or IBD and rifaximin was able to prevent that damage because of this anti-inflammatory effect. And it also helps heal the gut. Then if we scroll down, here's a bunch of cytokines that decreases IL-6, IL-10, IL-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferon alpha, tons and tons of inflammatory cytokines. Although with the exception of IL-10, IL-10 is not a bad cytokine, it's anti-inflammatory. But they went on to say that this suppressed the cytokines and that that the, hold on, repressed cytokine production is inhibited and intestinal permeability reduced. Guys, this is treating leaky gut. You reduce the inflammation, you take the fire off of the, you take the gasoline away from the fire and then the fire goes out. Your leaky gut goes away when you're not inflamed. Pretty big stuff. They also said that it increases wound healing. That sounds like a pretty rad thing. 
I want to heal my wounds. I don't know about you. Then here they're talking about a rat model where they administered rifaximin and it modulated gut microbial communities and it also prevented mucosal inflammation, prevented barrier impairment, again, prevented leaky gut and prevented GI inflammation, and it prevented or reduced visceral hyperalgesia. So that is a overzealous response to painful stimuli. An example would be if I pinch you, that should be a minor nuisance. It shouldn't be 10 out of 10 pain. But somebody with a hyper-responsive uh, pain signaling pathway, somebody who's hypersensitive to pain, if you pinch them, that's going to be excruciatingly 10 out of 10 painful. So hyperalgesia in the gut reduced with this mechanism. They also went on to say that the rifaximin treatment led to a dominance of lactobacilli and normalized IL-6 and TNF-alpha mRNA levels in the distal ileum of stressed rats. And they said inflammatory cell infiltration in the lamina propria was reduced, an effect likely mediated by lactobacillus, considering the reported lactobacillus-induced downregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines in Crohn's disease. So they're saying the rifaximin had anti-inflammatory effects itself, and it prevented intestinal permeability, it healed up the leaky gut, it reduced inflammation, it reduced the hyperalgesia, and it also allowed the lactobacilli to bloom. And then the lactobacilli had another anti-inflammatory property in and of themselves and further reduced the inflammation. Then it makes you wonder about people like Amy Myers, who are spouting nonsense into the internet and saying that people with SIBO can't take lactobacilli. It's hogwash, guys. It's utter hogwash. Let's move on to the other articles, though. Uh, this one also is interesting. So therapeutic effects and mechanisms of action of rifaximin in GI diseases. I just really like this last line, so I'm just going to cherry pick that for you. Rifaximin may be best described as a gut microenvironment modulator with cytoprotection properties. Pretty neat. That sounds like something I would want if I had GI disturbances. Let's go to another one. Selective improvement by rifaximin. So this one was really interesting. They studied patients who had minimal hepatic encephalopathy and cirrhosis. And they observed that rifaximin improved MHE, again, minimal hepatic encephalopathy. Rifaximin improved MHE in about 60% of the patients. But here's the cool part. What they labeled responders, so the people, that 59% who had improved clinical outcomes, the responders were the ones whose immune markers all normalized. The non-responders only had three of their immune markers normalized. They had a normalization in interleukin-6, CCL20, and T lymphocyte differentiation into Th22 cells. All the other immune markers were not altered, and that was characteristic of the non-responders. So whether or not you feel good on this drug might have less to do with the microbiome and more to do with your immune system. Fascinating. And then let's do one more just, just for funsies here. So the title kind of says it all, but I'm going to skip down here. So they were studying patients with cirrhosis and they said, collectively rifaximin alleviated hepatic encephalopathy and endotoxemia with improved intestinal hyperpermeability in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, and this effect is partially involved in a gut microbial change. Now, let me take myself out of head bubble mode, because I want to say the kind of the elephant to the room. I know I'm going to get a comment down below. I realize that modulating or changing the gut microbiome can elicit an anti-inflammatory effect, and it's entirely possible that some of what they're seeing clinically it, the anti-inflammatory effects of the drug are because of the GI microbiome modulation. I do understand that. But there are also studies where they put the cells on a Petri dish and they don't have the microbiome there, and it still elicits this anti-inflammatory effect. So I think it's a little bit of both. If you have a crop of Klebsiella or E. coli or Pseudomonas, if you have an overgrowth of bad bacteria, and you reduce that bacteria and you make room for things like lactobacilli and you're able to diversify your diet and diversify your microbiome again, that would absolutely be anti-inflammatory in and of itself. But it appears that this drug is in and of itself profoundly anti-inflammatory and healing for the gut and protective for the gut. And it can facilitate the healing of leaky gut. It can reduce endotoxemia. There's so much more to this drug. 
And this is not to say, to be clear, like I'm not even a prescriber, right? This is not to say that everybody needs to run out and get this drug. I'm just saying that when we test something out and we feel better and we deduce why that might be, we need to be careful and we need to research what are the multiple reasons why you might feel better on this thing. Another classic example, maybe you take oregano oil and you feel great and you think it's because it's killing the SIBO, but maybe you don't realize that oregano oil also kills candida and it also has antiviral properties and it also has anti uh, anti-parasitic qualities, and it's also anti-inflammatory, and it's aromatic. There are so many qualities to oregano oil beyond just the fact that it can kill the SIBO. And I think that rifaximin is the same. So don't fall into that logic trap that just because you felt better on rifaximin, that must mean that you have SIBO, because I don't think that that's true. At least there's a lot of mechanisms and a lot of pathways in the literature that show us that there is another possibility somewhere out there. So whether we understand it fully, I don't know. Um, I would say this, if you tried rifaximin and you felt great, and then you did other SIBO-ish strategies, like, you know, working on your motility and your MMC and taking some prokinetics, maybe doing some herbal antimicrobials, maybe taking a probiotic that's well-studied and well-proven to help with SIBO. If those other things also helped you feel better, and you have multiple data points, then I'm more willing to go with, yeah, maybe maybe you do have SIBO and maybe that is the thing that's directly causing your symptoms and you should pursue that. But if you're like so many people that I've worked with, where you take Rifaximin and feel great, and then all of your other efforts to kill and eradicate and starve the SIBO have not been fruitful, then I would have you re-examine the SIBO hypothesis in your life. Maybe you don't have SIBO, or maybe you have SIBO and it's not directly affecting your symptoms and and causing your symptoms, sorry, like almost breathed in spit. But you know, maybe it's not causing your symptoms. I know that's wild to think of, but you could maybe have asymptomatic SIBO or maybe the testing that you did was just wrong. I have videos on that. There are so many false positives in the SIBO breath testing world. It is astonishing. 88% false positives with lactulose? Forget about it, man, like that's worthless. So anyway, I just invite you to be curious and question everything. I suppose that's the best moral of the story for this video. Now, if you're one of those people that I mentioned before, where like you felt great on rifaximin and then literally nothing else has worked for you, or you've been just playing SIBO whack-a-mole trying to do restrictive diets and antimicrobials and you feel like nothing's working, maybe you need somebody to guide you. Maybe you need a little helping hand and an objective, unbiased third party to help lead the way. And that's why you've got me, darling. And I am proud to say FODMAP Freedom is enrolling again in August, so right around the corner. And I'm so, so excited. I have been working my tail off all summer to re-record it and revamp it so it's better than ever. It was really darn good to begin with, but it is so good now, and I'm so excited to bring it to you. And importantly, it's not like YouTube where I just throw out a video every week and hopefully it sticks and hopefully it helps the right people. FODMAP Freedom very tailored curriculum to help you with your symptoms. I send you little goodie bags and little trial packets of prokinetics and HCL, and I lead you through the challenge process with all of those. And we have group Q and A's multiple times every single week. So I do my live Q and A's basically for the entire afternoon on Friday. I do a 12.30 Eastern time until about 2.30. Q&A, and then I take about a half hour, pee, walk around, maybe get a snack break. Then I hit it again, and we go from about 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the second part of the Q&A for me. And then I also have a wonderful nutritionist who's a FODMAP Freedom Coach. She's been with me for years. She's been through this. She knows the program like the back of her hand. And she also hosts two of her own Q&As on different days and times so that there's something for everybody. You can get your questions answered. You could use the online community to chat with your peers. And you can always, always reach out to me and ask me all of your squirrely, squirrely questions because this is a squirrely kind of thing, figuring out what works for you and what doesn't and why might this happen, but then this doesn't make sense. That's why I'm here and I can't wait to support you inside FODMAP Freedom. If you haven't already, check out FODMAP Freedom and the link to join the waitlist is in the description. The URL is fodmapfreedom.com slash enroll. Or if you're in, like in the off season, if you're watching this anytime other than February and um, and August, then you would be automatically redirected to the waitlist page. 
but check it out. I would love to see you there. It is so different than any other program you've ever taken. And I guarantee it. If for some reason you go through the process and a year later, your gut isn't miraculously better, I'll give you your money back. Doesn't get much better than that. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.